Our study tonight begins in verse 25 of chapter 25, and we're going to go through all of chapter 26. And I want you to really stay tuned because chapter 26 is, at least in my view, practically speaking, the most important chapter in all of the book of Leviticus. And we're going to finish next week in the book of Leviticus. If you want to read ahead, we're going next into the prophecy of Amos. So you can read ahead and we will begin there two weeks from tonight. So two more studies in Leviticus. Tonight is all about choices. Father, as we open your word, we ask you to open our hearts by the power of your spirit, Lord. Help us to really grasp, I know I make this word up, Lord, but your bigness the things that you have for us, the promises that you make to us. And I pray tonight, Lord, everyone in this room will make the right choices. If there's even one here tonight who is not yet a believer, if they're not born again, in this Leviticus study, Lord, show them how much you want to bless them. You can't help yourself. It's just who you are. So have your way, Lord. Add to your family. We love you. We're grateful for all that you've done and continue to do. Now, now, Lord, in what is a very practical Bible study, minister to our hearts that we might bring you glory. All of this we pray in the beautiful and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight we sort of go to our own Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Blessings and cursings. I've been thinking about Crystal Lewis's old worship song. I don't know why you did what you did, but you did. And I'm grateful she was saying, but then she said, but you didn't have to do it. Well, all of the blessings that God has promised us, he didn't have to do any of that. I mean, most of us, the way we lived our lives, all of us separated from God by sin. We deserve nothing, and God came and gave us everything. And then as if it wasn't enough for him to save us, to rescue us from an eternity in hell, he said, you know what, I have a plan for your life, and I'm going to pour out a blessing on you that you can't possibly believe. All you have to do is do what I tell you to do. My last thought before getting into this is Cain. God spoke to him. Why are you so downcast, Cain? What's bugging you? If you do what is right, will it not go well with you? That's the lesson we get, especially in chapter 26. And by the way, chapter 26 effectively ends the book of Leviticus. Chapter 27, which will be our study next week, is an appendix, some things that were added sort of afterthoughts. So tonight, we're going to fly through the rest of chapter 25, but try to stay tuned because chapter 26 is that important. Chapter 25, verse 25 says this, if one of your countrymen becomes poor and sells some of his property, his nearest relative is to come and redeem what his countryman has sold. Now, the the nearest relative, the Hebrew word is goel. We're all familiar with that from the book of Ruth. Of course, Boaz was the kinsman redeemer, and he was a picture of our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the goel, or the redeemer, had a great responsibility to redeem the land of a family member who had lost it for whatever the reason was. And so the goel could go and redeem it. He would pay for it. He would sign a contract. And then the land then would revert back to the family. Again, this Goel is featured prominently in the book of Ruth. And that's where we are most familiar with it. If, however, a man has no one to redeem it for him, but he himself prospers and acquires sufficient means to redeem it, he is to determine the value for the years since he sold it and refund the balance to the man who, or to whom he sold it. He can then go back to his own property. But if he does not acquire the means to repay him, 
what he sold will remain in the position of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. We talked about that at, at length last time. Until the year of Jubilee, it will be returned in the Jubilee, and he can then go back to his property. Now, obviously, there were times back then, just like now, where people would fall into financial difficulty. The year of Jubilee, even in those kinds of dire circumstances, would always give the opportunity for the land to be redeemed or revert back to its original owner. That was in the rural areas. God was concerned about the land. In the city, it's different. Verse 29, if a man sells a house in a walled city, he retains the right of redemption a full year after its sale. During that time, he may redeem it. But if it is not redeemed before a full year has passed, the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to the buyer and his descendants. It is not to be returned in the Jubilee. But houses and villages without walls around them are to be considered as open country. They can be redeemed, and they are to be returned in the Jubilee. Now, obviously, the, the difference is simple. God was concerned about the land of Israel. He apportioned the land of Israel out to the 12 tribes of Israel, and it was an everlasting possession for them. And we're still seeing people, some 5,000 years after this was written, we're still seeing people fighting over and barring over the land that God says, you don't have any right to do that. That land belongs to me. So God was concerned about the land, not about the buildings in the urban areas. Verse 32, the Levites. The Levites always have the right to redeem their houses in the, in the Levitical towns which they possess. So the property of the Levites is redeemable. That is a house sold in any town they hold and is to be returned in the Jubilee because the houses in the towns of the Levites are their property among the Israelites. But the pasture land belonging to the towns must not be sold. It is their permanent possession. Now that's the only exception to all of what we've read, the, the Levites, remember God was their portion. God said, I will take care of you. They didn't reserve the right to own land and property as the other 12 tribes did. Now, as we get to verse 35, we see God's heart for the poor. We've seen it before in the um, uh, distribution of food uh, when he would say, don't harvest the corners of your property, leave that for the poor. Well, here's God's heart for the poor. If one of your countrymen becomes poor, and again, financial calamity happens to every person in every culture, and is unable to support himself among you, highlight these two words, help him. We have a tendency to look down on people that, that have difficulties financially, like they're, they're guilty of mismanagement. God says, no, the heart of God, our heart, remember Christ in us, the hope of glory, our heart has to be to help him. Help him as you would an alien or a temporary resident so he can continue to live among you. Do not take interest of any kind from him, but fear your God so that your countrymen may continue to live among you. Now, clearly in Israel, we know later in the book of Nehemiah, we know later that this is a command that they completely ignored. They were businessmen. And they were making business deals. I loan you money, you pay me interest on that money, and the interest was high. Nehemiah did some laying on of hands to some people who were violating this command. He says, you must not lend him money at interest or sell him food at profit. Here's the whole foundation for these commands. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. This is almost in verse 38, God saying, you know, it takes one to know one. Remember, you were slaves, and so don't mistreat slaves now just because you are having good fortune. Now, God's heart has always been to care for the poor, and our heart needs to be also the same. You know, earlier we read, as I mentioned, the welfare plan to ensure they had food, but now he demands, and every time you hear him say, I am the Lord your God, this is a demand. This isn't God making a suggestion. He's making a demand. And he demands that people who are able to help, those who need help, do so. 
So often we can walk by, and I'm not talking about giving money to every homeless person or everybody at a freeway off-ramp or on-ramp. But, but when we can help, we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. And when we can help, we need to be able to do so and not do so in a judgmental way. Just look at people who are having a hard time and share with them, communicate to them the heart of God. <clears throat> this should still be the model for how the poor are dealt with. It's not, sadly, in our world we've allowed people to make a living off of being poor. That was never the heart of God. So it's his heart. It also should describe our heart. We who are believers, we need to be generous. We need to be willing, even eager to help. And that's why God tells them, look, if you loan them money, don't charge any interest. That's the idea of usury. Don't make a profit from your help. Business people are always trying to make deals. And God says, no, no, the deal is I'm the Lord your God. You help those who need help. As I was preparing this Bible study for the last couple of weeks, the Lord kept reminding me that this was his heart for unusual kindness, which will be our free restaurant in our new building, and all of the other free ministries that we do. He simply wants to give. For God so loved the world that he gave, he wants us to be givers as well. <clears throat> now indulge me for a moment, because I think there's also some practical value for us in terms of how we deal with people. We Christians, you know, typically we want to help people. A lot of us are soft touches. Somebody will come and lay a story on us, and we'll get really, really sad, and, and we'll say, well, I'll, I'll loan you some money, and, and we do that. If you're going to loan money, the best way to do it is to loan money you don't need back. That way you can give it as a gift. People say, no, I'll pay you. I'll really pay you. Well, if you do, you do. But if you don't, I'm okay with it. We don't want to lose friends. So if you feel compelled to loan, don't do it. If you need the money back, don't do it. Because that way you can protect your heart from getting hard against those who promised that they'd pay you back and didn't have no expectations at all. That's always been the only way that I've loaned money. You know, a lot of people have paid me back. It's been great. But a lot of people didn't. Those people are still friends. That's really important. Don't lend money you need to get back. God will protect you there. Verse 39, if one of your countrymen becomes poor among you and sells himself to you, do not make him work as a slave. He is to be treated as a hired worker or a temporary resident among you. He is to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Now, obviously, we've got to talk about slavery tonight because this is where a lot of people have difficulty. In the world that we live in, slavery has always been a fact of life. God is dealing with slavery as a fact of life. It is true in the ancient world, just like it is now, that when people get in trouble, sometimes then the only choice they had was, well, I'm going to die or I'm going to sell myself as a slave. And that's always the kind of slavery that God is dealing with in the ancient world. Later, we're going to see that there's rules and prohibitions against kidnapping. You know, when we think of slavery, it was slave owners going to Africa, kidnapping people, and then bringing them either to the UK or to the United States and forcing them into slavery. God never has approved that kind of thing. In fact, in 1 Timothy, he talks about men stealers, and he consigns them to hell for eternity. And we need to understand, slavery was a fact of life. Slavery is a result of man's sin against other human beings. But in this particular case, the ancient world, Jews in particular, they had no other choice. So they would sell themselves to somebody else. They would work for a period of six years, and if at the end of six years they really loved the master that they were working for, they would go. They would become a bond slave. And what they would do is they go get their ear pierced, which says, "Now I belong to you by choice forever." Now the reason that's really important is because every one of us we were slaves to sin, and Jesus bought us out of our slavery, and then we come to Him. And we become bond servants or doulos in the Greek. We become slaves 
to Jesus Christ for life. And so we're all in slavery. He redeems us from that slavery. And just like in the ancient world, we have the opportunity then to say to him, God, I'm, I'm yours forever. The Apostle Paul says we're slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. And then he asks us to think about it. What value was there when you were a slave to sin? Think about the life that you lived. The freedom we have is that we can think about the life that God wants us to live. And that's really what we're going to encounter when we get to chapter 26. We wish God said slavery was wrong. Don't ever do it. But the world doesn't listen to what God says. The faces of slavery have changed. But the fact of slavery never has. Today, many of the people who are enslaved are young, underage women being trafficked all over the world. Jesus is going to come. He's going to fix all that. But for now, the world is just as evil, just as wicked as it was 5,000 years ago. It says, Then he and his children are to be released, and he will go back to his own clan and to the property of his forefathers. Because the Israelites are my servants, whom I brought out of Egypt, they must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. Deal with them with compassion and understanding. I heard someone, and I honestly can't remember who it was, but somebody just recently said, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And the slave owners, they had the right to, to kill their slaves. We have the, the, the little treasure in our New Testament, Philemon. And Onesimus was a slave who ran away from Philemon. And if he'd been found, he could have been killed. He was nothing more than property. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you, may, from them you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. You can will them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life, but you must not rule over your fellow slaves ruthlessly. One final thought on slavery. This has nothing at all to do with race. We need to understand that. We need to be able to communicate that to others. It has nothing at all to do with race. This is economic slavery. And in the ancient world, most often it was the person who was having misfortune who was making the choice to go into slavery. Verse 47, if an alien or a temporary resident among you becomes rich and one of your countrymen becomes poor and sells himself to the alien living among you or to a member of the alien's clan, he retains the right of redemption after he has sold himself. One of his relatives may redeem him. An uncle or a cousin or any blood relative in his clan may redeem him. Or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. He and his buyer are to count the time from the year he sold himself up to the year of Jubilee. The price for his release is to be based on the rate paid to a hired man for that number of years. If many years remain, he must pay for his redemption a larger share of the price paid for him. If only a few years remain until the year of Jubilee, he is to complete that and pay for his redemption accordingly. He is to be treated as a man hired from year to year you must see to it that his owner does not rule over him ruthlessly. Even if he's not redeemed in any of these ways, he and his children are to be released in the year of Jubilee. For the Israelites belong to me as servants. They are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt. Here we go again. I am the Lord your God. Chapter 26. I cannot impress upon you enough how important this is to each and every one of us. I told you earlier, it's about choices, the choices that we make. As we get into this tonight, I want you to realize that God has already made His choice. And His choice is given to us in the first 13 verses. When we get to the second part of chapter 26, those are the consequences for being disobedient or making bad choices. The key word in this chapter is the word if. 
It's a key word that's used repeatedly. We all like to think that, well, God, I'm a Christian, so God owes me this and he owes me that. No, these are conditional promises. This isn't an unconditional covenant such as the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is God simply saying, let's you and I sit down and negotiate here. I love you. This is what I want to do for you. And if you want me to do that for you, and when we read what he promises, we're all going to want that. Then God says, okay, here's how you get it, if. And all we have to do is be in the place. I talk about being under the spout where God's glory comes out. If we stay under that spout, we can't miss God's blessing because that's who he is. That's what he wants to do. And we need always to remember that God's not angry. God doesn't get impatient. God's not frustrated with us. God's not waiting for us to mess up. What God is waiting with bated breath to do is to bless you. To bless you. This is not a prosperity message. He wants to bless you. Because that's the choice he's made. He can't help himself. He says in verse 1, do not make idols. That is not the normal word for idols in Hebrew. This word is really the word nothings. That shows the heart of God. Do not make or set up nothings. What's the value of having idols in your life when they really are nothing at all? So do not make idols or set up an image or, or, or a sacred stone for yourselves. And... Do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. That's almost like a directional. God is saying, you want to know where to worship? Just look at me. I am the Lord your God. Now, we already know that Israel had issues with false gods. I mean, they're already remembering a golden calf. We also know that false god worship is going to plague Israel for the remainder of Israel's history. Babylon is going to come. Assyria will come before Babylon. And all because of the idol worship. From the beginning of time, God has been telling people, as I mentioned earlier, as he did with Cain, if you do what is right, will it not go well with you? That refrain needs to be running through your mind and your heart throughout this. It's that simple. You want to walk in the blessings of God? It really is that simple. We can rationalize it away. We can make excuses. We can look at all kinds of extenuating circumstances. But the reality is, if you walk in obedience to the Lord, you can't help but to be blessed. Acts 5.32. I repeat that a lot here at Calvary Chapel. God gives the Holy Spirit, and the context there is in power. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. That's the way if you're here tonight and your life is a bit messy, that's the way to get out of the mess. You just purpose in your heart to make the right choice. The choice is to obey. The solution is always that simple. The problem isn't because stubborn, sinful man has always insisted on doing things our way. Our message this past Sunday as we head into a new year now. This year, if you make the right choice, the blessings that God has in store for you are those kinds of blessings that can only come from a God who loves you. He says, observe my Sabbath and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. God has always been serious about his Sabbath and Sabbaths, which we will see tonight. Here's the key, if. Highlight every if as we go through this. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops, and the trees of the field their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape harvest will continue until planting. And you will eat all the food you want. And I'm going to stop there for a moment. Because that's the very first promise of God. I will provide for you. 
You don't have to worry about the seasons. You have to worry about the false gods of the pagan peoples that they pray to and make offerings to. All you have to do is obey what I'm telling you to do. Now, in this, he's referring to the previous 25 chapters. Just obey these things, and I will provide for you. Not just provide for you, where I told you to stop, you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in the land and you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove savage beasts from the land and the sword will not pass through your country. This is a promise of protection. we got provision, productivity, but we've also got protection. Now, this is really important. I mentioned in the message on Sunday that one of the mores that we're going to experience this year is more spiritual warfare. We all know that. If you're part of Calvary Chapel, you can't escape it. God says, don't worry about it. I'll protect you. You know, we can be terrified of the devil. We can see the devil behind every little problem that we have in our lives. God says, just ignore him. One of the best things about our theme here, just be with Jesus. When I'm hanging out with Jesus, I'm not even aware of the devil's presence. He can huff and he can puff and he can make threats, but he can't do anything. The Apostle John in 1 John says, he can't touch you. We don't have to be worried about those things. God will protect you when people come against you. You have to defend yourself. If you're being obedient, God will defend you. And that's what he's saying. The ancient world was a really, really harsh place. And God says, I got you if you do what I tell you to do. Now, these are promises of God's continuing blessings, and it's going to take all kinds of different forms. That's the reward for obedience And only God has the power to make good on these promises. Now, he's not writing to you and to me. He's writing to the people of Israel. But these principles, these principles are for each and every one of us. I often will talk to you about the promises just in one chapter in your Bible, Romans chapter 8. We ought to live in Romans chapter 8 if you really believe those promises. Only God can make those promises come to pass. And all we have to do is believe them and then walk in obedience to God's Word. God has made us greater promises, you and me, than He's making to the people now in Israel. And yet so many of us were living defeated lives. Either it's a lack of faith or we're simply not being obedient. This is one of those principles that works wonderfully for us while the specific promises are made just to Israel. You and I, we don't have to keep the Jewish Sabbath. We don't have to celebrate the feasts. But here's what we get to do. We get to walk with Jesus every day in the place of blessing. Verse 7, he says, You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. This is a promise of power. Now, I don't know a Christian that doesn't want more power of God in their lives. And that's something that we really have to focus on. Every day we need the power of God. Every day that power is available. I had to bring in my iPad today because they were putting some books on Kindle for me for upcoming studies in First John on Sundays. And and I, while I was looking, that I told Paul this morning, oh, I got to take it in, but it wasn't charged up. So you have to run out, charge it up before you can download. And I don't know how to download. I'm just speaking nonsense to me, but you guys get it. But but you got to charge up every day. The Christian has to charge up. And the way we do that is to connect to Jesus Christ. The way we do that is to purpose in our hearts to be obedient. And then the result of that is power. They're going to be powerful. Instead of the nation looking over their shoulder at all of the foreign nations, they're going to be the nation that is the most powerful. You can't help but to think about King David and his power and the marvelous victories that God allowed him to accomplish. This is a promise of power. 
Such is the power, he says, that five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. Now, I don't know about you, but immediately I think of Gideon. You have 32,000 warriors. God says, no, 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 it's too many. Immediately, 22,000 leave. And then they get all the way down to more. And, and God says, no, no, that's too many. I'm going to give you power. And then there's only a handful of people left. I think of Jonathan's armor bearer. What do you say we go up and engage the Philistines? If God says this, we'll go up and engage. If God doesn't say that, then, then we won't. But, but what do you think? And the armor bearer said, do everything that's in your heart. He understood the power of God. Again, I can think about David when he's being pursued in the wilderness by the far superior forces, both in terms of numbers and in terms of weaponry. The forces of King Saul. In our battle, day-to-day -day life, the spiritual warfare we face, the warfare that we face, we need not be afraid. He says, I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. Here's provision. Look at verse 10. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you have to move it out to make room for the new. Think about that for a moment. What do you need provision? Give us this day our daily bread, Jesus said. And God is simply saying, look, I'm your daily bread. That's what Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. You do what I tell you to do and you will not go hungry. The best gift is left for last. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. You know, just like Jesus at the wedding in Cana, saving the best wine for last, God has saved the best blessing for Israel and for you and for me for last. This is his presence. Again, we call this just be with Jesus. And that's all he's wanted. From the very beginning, all he wanted was to walk in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve. It's all he wants with you and with me. He's promised his presence. All we need is to obey him. And he makes it pretty simple. There's only one qualification, verse 13. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptian. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. This is freedom that's promised. If, 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 well, well, what do I get in this deal? Freedom. We get freedom. If we stop there, we'd be stopping in a high, but one thing to notice as we start in verse 14 is that the warnings here, this list is twice as long as the list of blessings. Remember, this is about choices. God is simply saying, I love you so much that you now know the consequences of your choices or you know the blessings that will result from your choices. And what this means, as we go through this list, what it means is that we don't ever escape consequences for the bad choices that we make in the same way that we never miss out on the blessing of God when we make the right choices. I'm trying to make this so simple that all we have to do is walk with the Lord. All we have to do is do what we say that we'll do. And by the way, every time we call him Lord, we're actually saying, Lord, you're in charge. You call the shots. I'm going to obey your orders. And then when we sort of reverse fields, we demonstrate that when we called him Lord, we didn't really mean it. That should remind all of you, Jesus saying, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, if I'm your Lord, why didn't you do what I said to do? If there's any one of us here tonight who thinks that we get a chance to sort of eh, negotiate obedience, you don't really understand anything at all about the Lord. We don't get a voice. He doesn't ask us our opinion. 
All he says is, look, if you do this, I will be with you. I will bless you abundantly. But if you don't, well, the rest of this chapter is the don'ts. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands. Now, just on the surface of this, verse 14 is, is, is ridiculous. I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm going to make this for us. I bought you out of slavery. I bought you out of sin. I promised you heaven instead of hell. Can you imagine Jesus looking at you and saying, but you didn't do those things? How would you ever explain that? I've talked a lot about the dynamics in marriages and in families. You know, so many of our homes, people are really angry. You hear husbands and wives yelling at each other, saying horrible things to one another, and often in the hearing of children who are supposed to respect their parents. How would any of us ever for a moment explain that to the Lord? For me, it's real simple. If I get frustrated or impatient with Paula, if I want to mutter under my breath and I go out in prayer with the Lord and want to grumble a little bit about something. He always says the same thing. Are you talking to me about precious? That's his name for her. How am I going to yell at precious? How could I ever explain that? You know, people will say we're only humans and we're going to argue, we're going to fight. Could we ever defend the way we argue, the things that we say, the tone of voice, or even the level of volume that we use. How would we ever explain to Jesus after everything that he's done for us? How would we explain looking at pornography? How would we explain getting drunk? How would we explain lying or cheating? That's why verse 14 is so silly in my mind. This is God. I am the Lord your God. We've seen that over and over and over throughout Leviticus. And we're saying, ah, but I got an out. And if we make the wrong choice, the rest of this chapter is devoted to the consequences of those wrong choices. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws, and by the way, when we are disobedient, even though we wouldn't characterize it, as abhorring or hating his decrees, that's what we're doing. Jacob, I loved. Esau, I hated. We know God is love. He didn't hate Esau. But his relationship with Esau was as though he hated him because he couldn't bless him. That doesn't mean Jacob was better. We know better than that. We, we know Jacob's history. But the idea here is, if we're not doing what God says, it's better if we're just honest enough to say, Lord, I just hate that command. I think it's okay if I do this. I don't care what you say. Now, we're, we're too careful to do that. But that's really what the end result is. He says, if we... Do these things fail to carry out my commands, all my commands, by the way, and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. Now, the rest of this chapter, I don't believe was ever intended this way, but the reality is that it is a prophecy of the rest of Israel's future, all the way down to the very end, after the Great Tribulation. All of these things Israel refused to do, and all of the warnings, well, God made them bear these warnings. The tragedy is that their history could have been so much different. Their history could have been a history of blessing, of peace and provision and power and all the other things that we talked about in the first 13 verses. But they made bad choices, and they made bad choices repeatedly. And I don't think they're a lot different than many of us. 
because we'll make a few good choices, but we make a lot of bad choices. We try to find a way to rationalize making those bad choices. We we don't say, well, that's sin, or, or well, I'm just living like I hate God. We'll use the word backsliding. We'll say things like, well, God is dealing with me on it right now, but I'm just not ready to stop doing this or doing that. And we need to be honest enough and say, Lord, I'm living like this because the reality is I hate what you've told me I can do or what you've told me I cannot do. Then I will do this to you, not for you. That was the blessings, the first 13 verses. Those are the things I'll do for you, God says. If you do what I tell you to do, then all of this is for you. But look what this is now. It's stuff that God will do to you. And I told you earlier that this list is twice as long as the list of blessings. He says, I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases, and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. If, after all this, you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. Now remember, none of this had to happen, but it did. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain, because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of the land yield their fruit. If you remain hostile towards me, remember again, that's how God sees our disobedience. He sees it as active, willing hostility and refuse to listen to me. I will multiply your afflictions seven times over. And please highlight the last part of this verse, as your sins deserve. Now, I won't spend a lot of time with this, but the reality is a lot of us, we sort of categories of sin, big sins, major sins, and if you want to know the definition of that, those are the sins that other people commit. But we have for our own sins, well, it's not a big deal, and I didn't mean it, my heart was in the right place, or we'll say something like, well, God knows my heart. But when we sin, we deserve consequences. We beg God that we can escape the consequences. We become again like Cain. Oh, the punishment is more than I can bear. God says, this is what we deserve. And one of the things that we've all got to do is we've got to get out of that mindset that says, well, just because we're Christians, we deserve God's blessings. You don't deserve any blessings at all. God pours them out. He wants to do that. But those blessings, New Testament or Old, are conditional upon our obedience to the Lord. Our salvation is an unconditional promise. If you're born again, you're going to heaven. But blessings here in this life, being used by God, having access to power and provision and, and, and all of the other things that we talked about, those are conditional and depend on our obedience. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. If you're living a life in disobedience, then you're going to miss out. One of the great things that's been happening here at Calvary Chapel now over the last couple, three, four months is that we've had so many new people coming and they're coming in and, and they're men and women many times with children. They've been living together for a long time and they're not married. And they're coming here, the word is being taught and they're being convicted and they're coming now eager to fix it. What do I do? Just this week on Tuesday, we had a wedding in our new wedding chapel, not at the building, but it was Pastor Will's office. Turned into a wedding chapel, and a whole family got right with God. You see, that's all God wants us to do, and now you should see the smiles on their faces. One of the great things I just found out about that particular family, and we've had multiple, multiple times where, where this has is, is been happening. But one of the things I just found out about this new couple is they live in the apartment complex right next door to our new building. 
It's like they can't escape. (laughs) That's the way God blesses us. And we tell people all the time, you know, right now you can take a situation that is not blessable and you can turn it into a situation that is eminently blessable and all you have to do is agree with God. Now, over the years, we've had a lot of people say, well, you know, I can't just get married now. There's a lot to to deal with. There's a lot to to do. We don't have money. We don't have a plan. Just, Just get in the place of blessing. And we've seen this now over and over and over again. And it's a wonderful sign that God's Spirit is really moving, and His Spirit moves first in conviction. And that's what's happening. He says, I'll send wild animals against you. Now, remember in the other list of blessings, I will protect you from the wild animals. Well, now he says, if you disobey me, I'll just turn them on you. They will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. If in spite of this, you do not accept my correction, but... I'm sorry, if in spite of these things you do not accept my correction, but continue to be hostile toward me, look at verse 24, I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict afflict you for your sins seven times over. Now, in Israel's history, we know they continued to be disobedient. Again, in the book of Nehemiah, it's just a great example that God moves miraculously. The people are privileged to be a part of it. Nehemiah has to go back to Babylon. And when he comes back from Babylon, sometime later, he finds uh, that the horrible things are going on. That's our human nature. We go through times where we're being obedient, God is blessing, and then we turn away from the Lord. He says we're acting with hostility. And then God just turns away from us And the result is as though we are facing the hostility of God. He says, And I will bring the sword upon you to avenge the breaking of the covenant, where when you withdraw into your cities, I will send a pestilence or a plague among you. I'm thinking about COVID. And you'll be given into enemy hands. When I cut off your supply of bread, Ten women will be able to bake your bread in one oven, and they will dole out the bread by weight. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. The idea there is that the bread will be rationed. There will be so little of it. If in spite of this, it's like God is saying, all these consequences are warnings to get right. If in spite of this, you still do do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me. And here's a serious warning. (coughs) Excuse me. Then in my anger, I will be hostile toward you, and I will punish you for your sins seven times over. Now, please take note that God didn't say, you're going to lose your salvation, Calvary Chapel. He didn't say to Israel, I'm going to wipe you off the face of the map. I'm done with you. I'm going to relent or recant on my promises. He didn't say that at all. He just said that he is going to punish them And that same principle is true for you and for me. Now, we don't like to think of God as a punishing God. But God simply lets the consequences of our choices do the punishing. And all of those consequences are designed to get us to do one thing. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, that means to agree with God about what sin is, He will be faithful and just to forgive you and wonderfully, gloriously purify us from all unrighteousness. Verse 29, he says, you'll eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. We know that happened when Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem. We know that happened. doesn't mean that God made them eat their children. But in the ancient world, that was just part of life. And God is simply telling the future. He's not causing it. I will destroy your high places. Cut down your incense altars and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols. And I will abhor you. I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries. And I will take no delight in the 
pleasing aroma of your offerings. We talked about that aroma very often in the early part of the book of Leviticus. It was a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord, you know, a barbecue with all of that fat burning. Imagine how that would smell. And God says, no, it'll be a stench to me. Now, this is, I think, critical for a lot of us. We go through the motions of worship. I think of Isaiah chapter 1. Your new moon feast, your festivals, my soul hates. I think God hates it. He hates it. When with our mouths we lay claim to serving God, but with our behavior, we're rebelling against him. Oh, I'm a Christian. Praise the Lord. I'm called to do this. I'm called to do that. God simply says, look, just live it or shut up. That's what he's saying, and he's been saying that for 5,000 years. I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. And honestly, there's just way too many Christian lives lying in ruins when they don't have to be. God has answers to everything that you're struggling with. And all we have to do is go back to the basics. Be obedient and you will be blessed. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the time that it lies desolate, the land will have the rest it did not have during the Sabbath you lived in it. And we know that the 70-year captivity in Babylon was determined to be 70 years because for 490 years, Jews completely ignored the Sabbath year of rest for the land. It's like God says, okay, I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar. Well, why would you do that? Well, because you owe me 70 years. Because you didn't take it seriously. I'm going to make sure the land gets its rest. Remember, it was a land flowing with milk and honey. 1948, when Israel was allowed to come back into their homeland as a nation, the land was absolutely desolate. You can look at pictures of the land, and it was just absolutely desolate. Today, Israel is one of the world's leading producers in agriculture. God replenished the land. As for those of you who are left, and talking about those who are in exile to Babylon, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and so many others, I will make their hearts so fearful in the lands of their enemies that the sound of a wind-blown leaf will put them to flight. Now that really does sort of describe how a lot of us as Christians were during COVID, doesn't it? One of the things that we need to understand, we can't be afraid of the things that the world is afraid of. We talk about God's sovereignty. We say we believe in God's sovereignty. We believe that God has a plan for our lives. We believe that he wants to bless us, and yet we are so fearful. And God says, my people don't need to be afraid. They will run as though fleeing from the sword, and they will fall even though no one is pursuing them. They will stumble over one another as though fleeing from the sword, even though no one is pursuing them. So you will not be able to stand before your enemies. You will perish. That doesn't mean they're going to perish totally, but, but what it means is that they're going to be away from their homeland, the land God gave them. 70 AD until 1948, they perished for all practical purposes from the face of the earth, at least as it relates to them being a nation. You will perish among the nations. They were scattered around. The land of your enemies will devour you. Those of you who are left will waste away in the lands of their enemies because of their sins. Also because of their father's sins, they will waste away. Now, if we ended right there, it would be almost hopeless. I hope the blessings, the first 13 verses, really, really hit home in your heart. And I hope that the verses from verse 14 through verse 439 will help you have a healthy fear of God. I think it's a good thing. I think this is a wonderful model for those of us who are parents. 
God is not a permissive father. God isn't one of those, well, you know, kids will be kids. That's not God at all. And we need to follow his pattern. We, we need to raise our children with a healthy fear of mom and dad, a healthy fear of authority. We don't do that because, well, everybody knows kids sort of run things at home in the world that we live in. I'm old enough that my job when my parents took me other places was to sit down and shut up and don't embarrass them. And there was always a price to pay. God is not a permissive Father, God is a Father who wants the best for you. And we need to remember that. We need to model our parenting style after it. Verse 40 is a blessing to all of us. It was 5,000 years ago. It is even now. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, there's that key word if again, if they will confess. Remember, as in 1 John 1, 9, Confess means to agree with God. We don't get to debate. We don't get to play word games. God, I did that. I turned on that ugliness on the computer screen, and I did it, Lord, because I wanted to. And I know that's wrong. I don't want to do that anymore. That's what confess means. It's not just the words coming out of your mouth. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't have done it. I'm so sorry. That's not a confession. Agree with God and make changes as a result of that agreement. But if they confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, their treachery against me and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, there's a lot of Christians, I'm talking about real Christians, whose hearts are uncircumcised. That's why Paul said, set your minds and your hearts on things above. That's what a circumcised heart does. It, it repents. And they pay for their sin. Look at this verse. I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. Please highlight that last, I will remember the land. You see, the land, that's what it's about. The people live in the land. They're God's guests. That one part of a sentence could solve all of the problems in the Middle East right now. And I will remember the land. That's why Israel is back in their own nation. That's why even though they're surrounded by nations who have vowed to wipe them off the face of the earth from the river to the sea, is the chant on college campuses and cities in our country. God says, I'm going to remember the land. Now here's something really important for you and me because we're going to be there with him. When he remembers the land, Jesus is going to step foot on the Mount of Olives. And it's going to split in two. And then things are going to get better. Then things are going to get fixed. For the land will be deserted by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees. None of us escapes consequences. I've said that several times. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or to hoard them so as to completely destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord your God. If you're here tonight and you've been doing some really, really bad stuff, that verse ought to hit, your home, hit home in your heart. God's not going to reject you. How many times have you had people say, well, I've done things that are so bad, God could never forgive me. God will forgive anything and everything. All you've got to do is humble yourself. Be honest about your circumstance. And then just run to God. I am the Lord, their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of 
of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. These are the decrees, the laws, and the regulations that the Lord established on Mount Sinai between himself and the Israelites through Moses. That's the end of the book of Leviticus. Again, we've got this appendage that we're going to talk about next week in chapter 27. But this is what God has to say. One quick reminder. All of this happened in about a 30-day period. That's when the book of Leviticus was written. How long is it going to take Israel? Having listened to all this, how long is it going to take them to do what they want instead of what God wants? Well, for two years, they're going to be around Mount Sinai. And then immediately they're going to forget and they're going to wander around the wilderness for 38 years until an entire generation perishes. Calvary Chapel, we're in the last days. We don't have time to waste. We don't have time to wander. We've got to be focused on what God's asked you to do. Blessings and cursings. We love the blessings. We all have plaques in our homes, put up on our walls with the promises of those blessings. But somehow, we don't buy any plaques with the cursings. If you do what is right, will it not go well with you? When you go home tonight and you lay down on your pillow, remember that. And God will say, all I want to do is pour out blessings upon you. All I want to do is be with you. And then he's going to ask you a question. Will you be with me? Father, as we close tonight, I want to thank you for this chapter.